Okay, I thought we were going to have some music. Here it is. They claim the soul Bible has outlived its day. That there are some changes that need to be made. Let no man to see. Take your Bible for change. Turn with me to Truth is determined by the test of time. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Whenever you're choosing to listen to this broadcast, I'm Brother David. I'm going to be your host and fellow student for the next oh, 30 to 45 minutes or so as we look at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. This is KJV Exposed. That's King James Version Exposed because we use the King James Version. We look at each verse break it down, bring it to life, and expose the meaning and show how God's Word is applicable and relevant to our lives today. Wash up! Wash up! What do you expect of a cook at your favorite restaurant? Should the person have experience as a cook, know the basics of food preparation, and follow recipes? Of course they should, but there is an even more basic expectation you have of your chef, and that is clean hands. Any business that deals with preparing food must be extremely conscientious about maintaining high standards of cleanliness. For example, no one would want to eat at a restaurant if news surfaced that a customer there found evidence that such standards had in some way been violated. In restrooms at restaurants, one will see the omnipresent sign that reads, Employees must wash hands before returning to work. Almost any job requires a person be qualified in some way to do it. But what qualifies a person to be a prophet of the Most High God? One might conclude that such a servant of God would need to meet a long list of qualifications. As we consider Isaiah's call to be a prophet, we may be surprised to learn that a standard that applied to him as a deliverer of spiritual food is similar to what we expect of those who prepare physical food. And that is, once again, cleanliness. Let's review the call of this great prophet. Isaiah received his call to be a prophet approximately 200 years after the nation of Israel separated into two kingdoms in 931 B.C. Israel, Israel is the northern kingdom, and Judah is the southern kingdom. Isaiah was living when the northern kingdom fell to the, uh, to the Assyrians in 722 BC, but his primary ministry was to the southern kingdom of Judah. The kings mentioned in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 are all kings of Judah. The life of Isaiah, <coughs> excuse me, the life of Isaiah illustrates the wide range of circumstances in which a prophet of the Lord could find himself as he carried out his mission. He served the Lord during the reign of one of Judah's most wicked kings, that would be Ahaz, as well as during the reign of one of Judah's best kings, and that was Ahaz's godly son, Hezekiah. In fact, Isaiah's counsel guided Hezekiah during an Assyrian invasion that threatened the southern kingdom in 701 BC. We see that in Isaiah chapter 37 verses 5 through 7 and verses 21 through 35 of that same chapter. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord in trusting faith. We see that in Isaiah chapter 37 verses 14 through 20. And Judah was spared the onslaught that had befallen the northern kingdom of Israel 21 years earlier. The fact that the call of Isaiah is not found until Isaiah chapter 6 causes some to wonder why it is not recorded 
er closer to the book's beginning, as is the case with Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Some suggest that Isaiah's call actually did precede his messages, but the account of the call is placed in chapter 6 to make a specific and important point. The messages in the first five chapters explain why a prophet like Isaiah was so desperately needed to confront God's people. The fifth chapter in particular elaborates on what has happened to a people originally called by God to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's Exodus chapter 19 verse 6. Isaiah chapter 5 features a word picture of a vineyard to describe both the Lord's care for his people and his disappointment that they had not produced the desired crop. We see that in Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 through 7. A Jewish tradition says that Isaiah suffered a cruel death of martyrdom by being sawn in two during the wicked reign of Hezekiah's son Manasseh. This incident may be referred to in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 37. And that brings us up to our text. We're going to read the entire text. Then we'll go back and break it down verse by verse and expose the meaning. We'll bring those verses to life, expose the meaning, and we'll show how God's Word is applicable and relevant to our lives today. Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 8 beginning in verse 1 and I am reading from the King James Version. Once again, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, beginning in verse 1. So if you would turn your Bible with me, turn with me in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. And twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo! This hath touched thy lips, and thine inequity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Our key verse is verse 8. I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. The first section of our scripture could be titled, So High, So High. We're going to break first one down into two parts, into two different sections. We're going to do the same thing with uh, verse 2. Okay. Verse 1 could be subtitled, The Exalted Lord. Okay, first part of verse 1 reads, In the year that King Uzziah died. The year that King Uzziah died was 740 B.C. He had been one of Judah's more godly kings. But he did not finish well because at one point he definitely entered the temple. He defiantly, not definitely, he both definitely and defiantly entered the temple to offer incense, an act reserved only for the priest. 
When he reacted angrily to the priest who confronted him, he was immediately stricken with leprosy and had to be quarantined for the remainder of his life. We see that in Second Chronicles chapter 26, verses 16 through 21. Uzziah's reign was one of the longest during the divided monarchy, covering a span of 52 years. Note that Uzziah is sometimes called Azariah, as we see in Second Kings chapter 14, verse 21, and again in Second Kings chapter 15, verse 1. And already brings me to a what do you think question. What do you think? How should Christians react to transitions in political leadership, if at all, and why? What about in the form and content of prayers? What about in discussions with fellow believers? And what about in discussions with unbelievers? Think about those things as we go through our scripture. The second part of verse 1 reads, I also, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Deaths of national leaders are accompanied by varying degree of uncertainty about the future. What follows in our text shows that any such concerns are unnecessary regarding Judah's future. Judah's ultimate king is still in control, as Isaiah declares in the verse before us. Some individuals in the Old Testament are privileged to see the Lord or a limited revelation of his glory. Look at Exodus chapter 24, chapter 24, verses 9 through 11, and Exodus chapter 33, verses 17 through 23. The Lord himself determines to what extent and by what means he allows himself to be experienced by humans. In the case of the prophet Elijah, he came in a still, small voice. We see that in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12. In the case of Job, he presented himself out of the whirlwind. Look at Job chapter 38, verse 1. Isaiah's experience of the Lord is likely by means of a vision, since the word saw is used. The manner in which Isaiah sees the Lord is similar to John's description of one who sat on the throne that we see in Revelation chapter 4 verse 2. On that occasion, perhaps something akin to this occurred with Isaiah. Also note Ezekiel's testimony in Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 2. Ezekiel chapter 3 verses 12 through 15 where the Spirit can be understood as the Holy Spirit. The train refers to the hem of the Lord's robe. Compare this with Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. The fact that it fills the temple conveys an image of the Lord's majesty and splendor. It is difficult to say whether the temple Isaiah sees is the earthly, is the earthly temple of Solomon in Jerusalem or the heavenly temple. Clearly, John's vision in Revelation is one of heaven. Look at Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. In Isaiah's case, one should keep in mind how King Uzziah had violated the sanctity of the Jerusalem temple by offering incense when he was unauthorized to do so. Perhaps Isaiah's vision is of this earthly temple in order to show him, and in turn, the nation of Judah, that the Lord has not departed from the temple. Contrast this with Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 22 and 23. We now come to verse 2. And once again, we're going to break verse 2 down into two different sections. And it could be subtitled, The Heralds of the Holy. Okay, Heralds of, Ho Heralds of the Holy. Actually, verses 2 and 3 could be under that subtitle. The first part of verse 2 reads, Above it stood the seraphims. Seraphims are mentioned in the Bible only here and in verse 6 of this same passage. The term comes from a Hebrew word meaning fiery. For the seraphims to have such an appearance would certainly be fitting 
since fire is indicative of God's presence as we noted in last week's study of Moses and the burning bush. Look at Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 through 6 and compare that with Exodus chapter 24 verse 17 and Revelation chapter 4 verse 5. Okay, now we come to the second part of verse 2. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. We are not told how many seraphim Isaiah sees, but we are told that each has six wings. This characteristic highlights another similarity to John's vision where the four beasts round about the throne each have six wings. Look at Revelation chapter 4 verses 6 through 8. The covering of both face and feet may represent complete submission to the one seated on the throne. One might say that from head to toe the seraphims recognize his authority. Now the second part of verse 3 reads, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The cry of the seraphims is similar to that of the four beasts in Revelation chapter 4 verse 8. The threefold repetition of the word holy serves to emphasize that quality. The concept of holiness implies separation or distinctiveness. Such separation is primarily ethical or moral and only secondarily positional or geographical. That is, this is why, this is why Isaiah becomes so distraught at being in the Lord's presence that we'll see in verse 5. He knows how unholy, how sinful he and his people are. Brings me to a what do you think question. What are some ways to manifest personal holiness as befitting our holy God? What about as the holy temple of the church at worship? And what about as the holy temple of the church meets needs? And can you think of any other situations? Okay. Now the second part of verse 3. Reads, I'm sorry, we broke verse 3 down into two different sections, didn't we? The second part of verse 3 reads, The whole earth is full of His glory. Isaiah is seeing God's glory in the temple, whether earthly or heavenly, but His glory cannot be confined to any structure. Solomon acknowledged the same truth at the dedication of the temple he constructed in Jerusalem. Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded. That's in 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 27. The whole earth, the whole earth, God's creation is a testament to his glory. This theme is echoed often in, in the Psalms. Uh, for example, look at Psalm chapter 8, verse 1, and Psalm 72, verse 19. We now come to the second section of our scripture, and it could be titled, So Unworthy, okay? Verse 4 is an overwhelming scene. Let's look at it. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah has heard the proclamation of God's glory from the seraphims. Now he begins to experience it in an intensely personal way. The shaking and the presence of smoke remind one of what the Israelites witnessed at Mount Sinai. Look at Exodus chapter 19 verse 18. They were terrified by such a demonstration of holy power. The stage is set for Isaiah to express similar anxiety. We now come to verse 5. Isaiah is overcome with guilt. Verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Just as the Israelites trembled at the presence of God at Mount Sinai, Isaiah is overcome with a sense of his unworthiness to be in such sacred surroundings. His sense of feeling terribly out of place reminds us of how Adam and Eve attempted to hide from God after breaking his commandment. Look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. Isaiah finds himself gasping for breath in a spiritual sense. He is painfully aware of the immeasurable gap between himself and the holy God into whose presence he has been ushered. He knows he has no business seeing what he does. King Uzziah may have died, but Judah's real and ultimate king, the Lord of hosts, still rules. Isaiah's mention of his unclean lips and the fact that he dwells in the midst of a people of unclean lips seems to focus on speech. Perhaps Isaiah initially desired to join the seraphims in their praise of God, but now he realizes that to do so would be the height or depth of hypocrisy. How can holy words be spoken by an unholy person? In the previous chapter, the prophet promised a series of six woes on the people. Look at Isaiah chapter 5, verses 8, 11, 18, 20, 21, and 22. And then started this indictment. Therefore, as the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath scattered forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them. Isaiah's seventh woe directed at himself in the verse before us, completes the sequence. The number seven often represents completeness or totality in Scripture. Perhaps he fears that the hand of the Lord will also be stretched angrily against him as well. We now come to the third section of our Scripture, and it could be titled, So Fitting, okay? Verses six and seven could be subtitled, Action and result. Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, as, in re as if in response to Isaiah's admission in the previous verse, most, not most, one of the seraphim, one of the seraphim goes into action on Isaiah's behalf. The altar from which he takes a live coal possibly refers to the altar in the temple Solomon built. But an altar in a temple of the heavenly environs cannot be ruled out because an altar is present there as well. Look at Revelation chapter 6 verse 9. Isaiah must be watching the unfolding scene with great apprehension, having just confessed his own sinful unworthiness. Is he about to be punished? Verse 7, And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine inequity is taken away, and thy sin purged. It is not unusual for prophetic visions to appeal to the senses. This helps the recipient understand that what is happening in Israel is real. Compare Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 9 through 13 and Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 4 through 28 with this. Regarding Isaiah, four of his five senses have informed his experience thus far. By sight, he beholds the Lord. By hearing, he perceives the declaration of the seraphims. By sight and smell, that's assumed, he is aware of smoke. And now, touch comes into play. We do not know if Isaiah feels any sting or pain from the red, hot coal that is touched to his lips. If so, it must be temporary, as the words, Thine inequity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Speak not of judgment, but of forgiveness. The association of fire with the presence of God bears revisiting. While God is indeed a consuming fire, what Isaiah experiences is the fire of cleansing or purging. As fire removes impurity from metals, Isaiah is not undone as he had earlier feared. Instead, he has received 
a great work of grace. Destroyed, tested, purified, destroyed, tested, purified. The horror of destruction by fire was realized to a massive degree in World War II. Germany was the first to firebomb cities. Doing so in nighttime terror raids, Allied forces eventually did the same in return. The morality of the firebombings of Dresden, Tokyo, and other cities is still debated. Fire changes things. Biblically, such changes can be seen in at least three contexts. Judgmental destruction, testing, and purification. Judgmental fire is depicted throughout the Bible from Genesis chapter 19 verse 24 to Revelation chapter 20 verse 14. Fiery testing is seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 12 through 15 and 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12. Purification by fire is described in Numbers chapter 31 verses 22 and 23. Not infrequently, these concepts overlap. For example, testing and purification overlap in cases when the former results in the latter, as in Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9. We also see overlap between testing and purification in tonight's text as the prophet experienced a live coal placed on his lips. But the overlap seems to be in the reverse direction. Purification came first, then the testing of Isaiah's resolve came later as he preached judgment to a hostile audience that God foresaw would not listen. Isaiah, that's Isaiah chapter 6 verses 9 through 13. Since God states that fact after Isaiah accepted his call, we wonder if the man would have volunteered had he heard the prediction of mission failure first. That question is relevant tonight and relevant today since Jesus described his own mission by quoting Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9 verses 9 and 10 in Matthew chapter 13 verses 14 and 15. Before we go to Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20, we must recognize our own sin and the need for having had it purified. Look at Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. But all our preparation will not equip us for the testing of sorrow that comes as we encounter cold, unrepentant hearts. We are Isaiah. Brings me to a what do you think question. What do you think? What are some ways the church can audibly and visually stress the reality of sin taken away by Christ? What about during baptisms? What about in, in observance of the Lord's Supper? I encourage you to attend a local house of worship. Okay. One of the things you need to look for is how often do they observe the Lord's Supper? There is no scriptural mandate on how often that is to be done. My own personal opinion is it should be done every Lord's Day. That's how it was done in the early church. You look at Acts and constantly and continually we see they were gathered for worship, the singing of hymns, and the observance of the Lord's Supper. Let's continue on with our story, with our study. Uh, we're going to break verse 8 down into two parts once again. And it could be subtitled Challenge and Acceptance. Okay. First part of verse 8 reads, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I need? And who will go for us? To this point, Isaiah has not heard the Lord speak. Only the seraphims. Given what happens when they speak, what must Isaiah think will happen as the Lord himself does so? Elsewhere in Scripture, the voice of the Lord produces utter terror in those who hear it. Look at Exodus chapter 20 verses 18 and 19 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 25. It is described as powerful and full of majesty with awe-inducing results. Look at Psalm 29 verses 4 through 9. 
Yet when Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord, the tone is not terrifying. Instead, the tone appears to be that of pleading for assistance. The Lord is fully aware of the people of unclean lips whom Isaiah has mentioned. He needs someone to go to them, so he asks, Who will go for us? The use of the pronoun us is similar to the language used in the creation of human beings and, res and in response to the building of the Tower of Babel. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and Genesis chapter 11 verses 6 and 7. The plural pronoun may refer to God plus the seraphims who have been present throughout Isaiah's vision. Or it may refer to the persons of the Trinity. It is interesting to consider how much Isaiah has to say about the persons of the Trinity in his prophetic messages. Look at Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, Isaiah chapter 32, verse 15, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16, Isaiah 52, verse 3, verses 13 through uh, Isaiah 53, verse 12, Isaiah 59, chapter 20, chapter 59, verse 21, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4, and Isaiah chapter 63, verses 10 through 14. How do we discern God's call? Discerning God's call, okay? We'll get to the rest of uh, verse 8 after we talk about discerning God's call for, for, for a moment here. Charles Spurgeon, the famous 19th century preacher, had no formal theological training. Yet he preached through thousands every Sunday for more than 40 years. Had did God call him to such a task? Once when describing his call to ministry, Spurgeon said it was an intense, all-absorbing desire for the work. Those who like neat logical categories may be unsatisfied with that description. They may desire to have the idea of God's call examined in specific terms of form, content, and so on and so forth. Perhaps we may discern a more practical approach in the New Testament. For God's calls seem to come about as character and spiritual giftedness are observed. The first century church chose seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, to serve in a certain capacity. Look at Acts chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Those were the first deacons. Okay. Can we not conclude that they answered God's call to do so? Barnabas seems initially to have simply grown into his leadership role, having been recognized by others as a son of consolation, who led by example and spoke up on behalf of others. These traits were evident before he was set apart for missionary travels by specific directive of the Holy Spirit. Martin Luther was on target when he described his call as God's voice heard by faith. When our aptitudes, spiritual gifts, circumstances, and opportunities come together, let us make sure we are not overlooking God's call. Now, we come to the last verse of our lesson tonight. It is the second half of verse 8. And it is Isaiah speaking. Isaiah, this is Isaiah speaking. Verse, second half of verse 8 reads, then said I, Here am I, send me. Isaiah had just declared his own lips to be unclean, but since these have now been touched by the live coal and purged, he is free to speak words of commitment to service on behalf of the holy God. Here am I, send me. Isaiah's unholiness came to be corrected through the cleansing action taken by one of the seraphims, but the prophet's own omission of unholiness had to come first. It is interesting to contrast Moses' hesitant reaction of, Who am I 
in response to God's call with Isaiah's seeming eagerness to respond, whereas Moses' reply could be summarized as, Why me? Isaiah's may be restated as, Why not me? Consider how each man experienced a powerful, unforgettable demonstration of God's presence, yet each reacted to God's call quite differently. Even so, God is able to take each man as he is and shape him into the man he needs to be. Both Moses and Isaiah learned an important lesson that is still true. In the Lord's training ground, surrender is the key to victory. In the Lord's training ground, surrender is the key to victory. And that brings me to one last what do you think question. What do you think? What should others see in Christians who claim to be answering God's call? What about in use of our time? What about in use of our money? What about in our relationships? Let's think on those things. The edge that spiritual words are meant to possess can be dulled with misuse. Without thinking, we may utter insipid interjections such as holy mackerel. We may refer to a misbehaving child as a holy terror. Isaiah's vision of the holy God had an intensity that we will probably never experience in this earthly life. The intensity of his experience will be further diminished for us as we misuse the word holy. The holiness of God must be understood in an absolute sense. The, that understanding was what caused Isaiah to be utterly dismayed by his own lack of holiness. To take a nonchalant view to take a nonchalant view of one's own unholiness probably indicates a failure to understand what it means to be holy. We know that God is love. We see that in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16. Do we also know that God is holy, holy, holy? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Help us each day to examine ourselves for unholiness that we that may interfere with saying, Here am I, send me. We pray this in the name of the Lord of all holiness. Amen. As we close out tonight, leave you with this thought to remember that may Isaiah's vision of a holy God leave us wholly committed to him. Let me say that again. May Isaiah's vision of a holy God Leave us wholly committed to Him. This is Antichrist Ministries, Biblical Focal Points, KJV Exposed. It's King James Version Exposed. We are on every Wednesday, 9 p.m. Every Wednesday at 9 p.m., though we are usually up and running earlier than that. Stay tuned next week as we will be looking at... The, pro the major prophet, Jeremiah. <clears throat> I need to get a drink here real quick before we close out. I hope you have learned as much as I did from this lesson. I hope you have been blessed by it. And I hope you will continue to tune in every Wednesday and listen to us. Like I say, we are up and running by 9 p.m. on every Wednesday, though the program is usually up way before then. Be safe, be blessed, stay in the Word, and write the Word upon your heart. They claim the soul Bible as I've lived its day. That there are some changes that need to be made. Let no man deceive. Take your Bibles or turn with me to Matthew 24.
Truth is determined by the test of time. Trust the old Bible with the kings and knights. Never mind those people who won't throw it out. Church is hard to be and falling away. We need this so much more than ever do. Tampered with the Bible and with the news and news. Nothing is sacred. Oh, what the children know? Our way of life is changing and people don't care. The signs of the end we see.